Okay, everybody, today our training session will be sponsored by Ozarka. <laughs> this water is refreshing and nutritious. <laughs> Help me. Just tell me when. Go. <laughs> Good morning. It's August 19, 2015. Welcome to Real Estate Tips. I'm Wayne Russell, instructor, broker associate with REMAX Southwest, Shirt Atlanta, Texas. Most of the information that we discuss comes from realtors, newspaper articles, magazines, and emails from different sources. The material provided here is for information purposes only and is not intended and should not be considered as legal advice for your particular matter. Uh, before I get started, I uh, just wanted to uh, let you know that uh, Friday, uh, we, uh, five of us here from the Atomic Company, fr from, from the office here, uh, bowling of the Fort Bend Bullathon, which was August the 14th, and uh, it was sponsored by uh, Champion School of Real Estate and Smart Financial. Aston Woods, uh, Home Trust, Gallery Furniture, Starkey, Stewart Title, and uh, actually, uh, we came in third place. That's pretty good. All right. And uh, actually, we were in a pickle, and uh, we wanted, we needed some shirts for uh, our family, so someone stayed up till about 12:30 the night before, and made us some shirts. And thanks to Christina, we had shirts and looked like a bowling team. So, anyway, that's pretty cool. <laughs> anyway, uh, we uh, we did okay. We we did, we did fine, and uh, just want to let you know it was a tree pack. And uh, what does tree pack stand for? Tree pack stands for Texas Association of Realtors Political Action Committee. It's a nonpartisan organization that fights to protect property rights and continues to help make Texas a great place to call home. Okay. Um, some water. <laughs> <I got some. laughs> anyway, I wanted to uh, just, just cover up some business news. Uh, I always like to cover a little business news so that's that's going to affect uh, the Sugarland area. Oh, by the way, uh, Bluebell is coming back at uh, August thirty first. So, uh, just wanted to I was tell you about to that. Sell the last of my ice cream. Right, you got uh, Chocolate Rocky Road and uh, and uh, Vanilla and Chocolate. What is that? The Great Divide. <laughs> Anyway, they're coming back at the end of August, yeah, and uh, that's uh, and then HEP expects that. But also, I think uh, they're going to have it at uh, Randall's and uh, uh, Kroger. So, and also too, the next one is uh, builder pre-sales begin in Fox Bend. The Toll Brothers uh, Venezuela Bardo Home Design Above will be offered in Fox Bend, a gated neighborhood, luxury homes in new villages, the Sawmill Lake, and Sienna Plantation, <coughs> and those prices start about five hundred and eighty thousand. Uh, also, the, uh, one more article in the newspaper, home sales going strong, <coughs> stubbornly low, all prices have market unfazed. Houston area home sales were stronger than ever in July, demonstrating a striking resilience in the face of stubbornly low all prices that threaten jobs in the region's dominant industry for foreseeable future. So, we had uh, the buyers closed on an estimated 8,147 single family homes last month according to HAR. Uh, Next is a little, uh, if you, I think it's good if you have certain listings in certain areas so that you'll be familiar with what's going on, especially if you have any listings in the uh, old Sugar Land off of Brook Street. Oh, I didn't see you sitting there, Christina. Project will link trails in Sugar Land. Officials say Connector will be a major route between retail outlets and eateries. Uh, Sugar Land has, has awarded a $1 million contract to build hike and bike trails in Imperial Park along Brook Street. It will serve as a link providing pedestrian and bike con con connectivity from Texas 6 to US 90. This has been a long time coming, said City Council Steve Porter, who represents District 1. The residents in that area will appreciate this mightily. The city believes the Imperial Trail Connector will be a major route between retail establishments and restaurants. The project is, uh, is part of the city's trail master plan, and the master plan calls for construction of a trail system that includes 170 miles of bike lanes. Wow. So if you're biking, you'll have plenty of room to uh, travel from one end of Sugar Land to the other. Yeah, I, I read that we were going to be like number one city for bikers. Mm. Could be. I mean, Thank you. Unbelievable. So the master plan calls for construction of a trail system that includes 170 miles of bike lanes and hike and bike paths. City spokesman Doug Adolph said, City Council awarded the $1 million contract to DG Medina Construction. 
Uh, also, two developer unveils renovation plans for historic Imperial Sugar Refinery. You know, the one you know, drive by on 90 there near 90 and Brook Street. Anyway, the former Imperial Sugar Refinery is slated to become Sugarland's next retail and commercial center. Imperial Market Development unveiled next uh, new plans to renovate the historic site to include shopping and dining options. you will never been over there, it's going to be kind of cool. Uh, the initial designs for Imperial Market de uh, Detail, an upscale mixed use project that also features a 120 room aloft hotel and former char house, Class A office space, and residential options. Construction on the 777,500 square foot farmland refinery located off Highway 90 and 6 is expected to begin later this year and is projected to be completed in 2017. Doug Dahl, Chief Operating Officer of Johnson Development. Uh, and he, they're really pleased with, the, with, with what they have planned for the site. By the way, uh, that's Johnson Development. Is the Sugar Mill still going to become a children's uh, museum? Have you heard of that? I, I don't know. I heard that about maybe almost a year ago from that, That's Olson. my understanding, too. It's still yeah, from <laughs> Nancy Olson, you know, she's pretty I much I think it'll affect the values, too. In other words, when you go out and get listings on property or showing property and they're asking questions about the area, I think it's good to be informed about what's going on about when they're redoing the Imperial Sugar. So when you get a listings in the area, like on Brook Street, uh, that uh, may affect uh, your sales, you know. They say, hey, I want to be over there. Uh, this is also the last one here, Imperial Sugar Land Project Update. Imperial Market Development presented the plans for former Imperial Sugar Refinery Sugar Land Council during its June 23rd meeting. Renovations to the historical sites are intended to preserve the existing buildings and attract new commercial activity uh, to Highway 90. Just for your only information, if y'all are out showing properties or showing new subdivisions and the buyer says, who's the developer of, of this subdivision? Well, Johnson develops Cross Creek, Edgewater, and Fall Creek, Harmony, Imperial, Riverstone, Sienna, Tus Tuscan, uh, Willow Creek, uh, Wood Forest, Harvest Green, and Central Grand Central Park. And there's a map of uh, the developments, just in case you're out in that area. And... Uh, also, too, if you're handling properties in Missouri City, there's going to be two municipal man management districts were created in Missouri City during the 84th Texas legislature to spur growth in an area that has been a recent decline in retail and residential developments. And these are called MMD, Municipal Management Districts. Just one more. You know, you might want to have, if, if you're in that area, you might want to use a, they don't have an addendum for that. Nor do they have one for certain things. You know, they yeah, usually end up using the mud addendum for these for these things. But it could affect some of your property. They could be selling in a certain area. So anyway, I just wanted to bring it to your attention. This is in Missouri City, and this is a map of uh, what it's going to be like uh, in the in the area. Uh, what about MUDs? MMDs and municipal utility districts share similar powers by providing water, sewer, and drainage utilities in undeveloped areas. However, MUDs are typically established in cities' ex extraterritorial jurisdiction to spur residential development. And MMD is used to help foster economic development within, within uh, city limits. Okay, let's uh, get in back to real estate again. Uh, the real estate tips in my outline uh, for demanding of earnest money. Margie's title policy, TREC, has, uh, has a fixed agreed to sales price with no contingencies. Commercial property sold as is. Should realtor be a party to home inspections, closing del delays, and uh, after October the 3rd, you, you better have an amendment to contract for extending closings. And also in your contracts, you, you probably, instead of 30 days or 45 months, would just put 60. Is your assistant allowed to do that? Uh, emails create an enforceable earnest money contract. That's like that. You have to be careful what you say in your emails. Because if uh, the, the buyer says something in an email or seller says something in an email that conflicts with the contract, you may have a new contract. So, I mean, be careful what you say in emails. What a tenant can do in domestic violence situations and changes to one to four family residential contract and code of ethics. You're good. Do you have an extra one? Since I took, I think I took his Watch it. Okay. Uh, okay. See, I only made eight copies, so there's uh, more than enough. I'll, I'll make you some more. Anyway, uh, notice of demand regarding earnest money. I uh, a lot of a lot of times you, you usually figure out some kind of way uh, to get your earnest money back, or you lose your earnest money, and you probably don't have to make demands, but. 
Apparently, uh, the there was a conflict. Uh, the buyer couldn't get his loan, and so the buyer was asking for his earnest money back after the third party financing. The number of days the third party financing had gone past it, and so the buyer wanted his earnest money back. And so there are certain ways of doing that and getting your earnest money back. And so uh, apparently the uh, buyer had made a request for, uh, say, $1,500 for earnest money. And uh, the seller said, no, 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 we'll split it 50-50. Well, the buyer insisted on getting his earnest money back. So he sent an, uh, uh, an email uh, to the title company. I didn't get a copy of it, but uh, requesting uh, uh, the title company to to give them the earnest money back. So now this is a response from, from the title company to the seller. And it says uh, the, the order number is usually the GF number. That's a general file number. The notice is given in accordance with the terms of your contract which specify that, that if one party makes written demand for the earnest money, an escrow agent shall give notice of the demand by providing to the other party a copy of the demand. You are hereby notified that we have received demand from so-and-so and a copy of that demand is attached. I didn't, as I said, I didn't get a copy of that. If we do not receive written objection, in other words, if they don't, if the seller doesn't object within 15 days after the postmark date of this letter, we may disperse the earnest money to the party making demand reduced by the amount of unpaid expenses incurred on behalf of that party. They may have ordered a survey, they may have ordered some uh, tax notices, and they can subtract that from X dollars from the earnest money. By providing the notice we have compiled with the, uh, we have complied with the provisions of your contract which stipulate that you thereby release us from all adverse claims related to dispersal of the earnest money unless we receive from you a notice of objection to the demand before the expiration of 15 days from the postmark date of this letter if you object to the demand and you are, if you if you object to the demand and you are the other party cannot come up to an agreement regarding this dispersal of earnest money we must continue to hold the funds as disputed until such time as they become eligible for a sheet of the state of Texas. A lot of times you'll talk to agents and they say, oh, it's just going to end up in the state, and it, and it could. And just for your own information, what does a cheat mean? Is a common law doctrine which transfers the property of a person who dies without heirs to the crown or state. Anyway, and also, too, uh, on page... Uh, uh, six of nine of the one to four family it says at the bottom demand upon termination of this contract either party or an escrow agent may send a release of earnest money to each party and the party shall execute the counterparts of the release and deliver same to escrow agent. If either party fails to execute the release, either party may make a demand for the escrow. I'm repeating myself, but it, th this, this letter that comes from the title company, he, they get the information from the one to four family contract. If either party fails to execute the release, either party may make a written demand for the escrow agent for the earnest money. If only one party makes written demand for the earnest money, the escrow agent shall promptly provide a copy of the demand to the other party. If escrow agent does not receive written objection to the demand of the other party within 15 days, escrow agent may disperse the earnest money to the party making demand reduced by the amount of unpaid expenses incurred on behalf of the party. Receiving the earnest money, an escrow agent may pay the same to creditors. Also, too, I wanted to make... Uh, I'm going to cover this again on these changes that's coming in the trick forms, but also just past, just next to that or down below is damages. It's also, and I'm going to bring this up and then I'm going to bring it up again. It says damages any of the party who wrongly fails to refuse to sign a release, that's a release of earnest money, acceptable to the escrow agent within seven days of receipt of request. Uh, will be liable to the other party for liquidated damages in the amount of equal to sum of three times the amount of earnest money, the earnest money, reasonable attorney's fees, and all cost of, of the suit. Anyway, now let's. I'm going to come back to that a little bit. So uh, this next one is I'm jumping over to how title insurance works with seller financing, and I know that y'all have come across the seller financing in the past. But anyway, my client is purchasing the property by means of seller finance, and I know that the lenders require a mortgagee or a lender title insurance policy to protect the lender from any problems with the title. But would the buyer in this case still have to provide a mortgagee's policy to the seller? And there's a difference between mortgagee's policies and title policies. Yes, if you're using TREC contracts, paragraph 4C of the TREC contract stated the owner policy of title insurance is furnished to the buyer. In a seller financing transaction, the buyer has to provide the seller with mortgagee's policy of title insurance. And the uh, also, too, in the 
first page of the contract, the one to four family states at the bottom, seller financing that the uh, buyer shall furnish seller with mortgagee's policy of title insurance. What is the difference between owner's policy and, and mortgagee's title policy, or mortgagee's policy? The owner's policy, these policies are advisable but typically not required. This policy will protect the purchaser of the property. That's the owner's policy. The next one is the mortgagee's policy. This type of policy protects the lender. In other words, if it's if it's a landowner finance or if it's a or if it's a mortgage company or the bank or whoever, they're going to want a mortgagee's policy uh, to protect themselves. In case they also too want to sell that note, it's easier to sell that note when you have a mortgagee's policy. The next one is. Uh, Trek Farm has the fixed degree sales price with no contingencies. I'm on this page right here. And uh, I have a property under contract. It is uh, described as 3.87 acres. When the survey was done, it showed there were four acres. The seller is now demanding more money and refuses to close. Can he do that? Since he used the Trek Farm 911 for an unimproved property, it is, has a fixed agreed to sales price with no contingencies. In other words, you didn't put anything in special provisions that the price would be adjusted based on so much a square foot or so much per acre. And if you didn't do that, then the sales price is set for X dollars, even though it comes up to a little bit more than, than you thought that was in, in, involved in the property. But anyway. With no contingencies for adjustment after the survey is done, assuming both parties can easily identify the property in question, you're fighting over only a calculation. The contract gives the buyer a right to approve the survey, but not the seller. The buyer has the right under the default paragraph to sue for specific performance. Um, anyway, the next next one here is I'm buying a track of commercial property with the shopping center on it. The seller refuses to make any representation and insist on selling the property as is. Well, you know the difference between 7D1 and 7D2 in the contract. 7D1 is as is. As is. I know you have an option period to terminate the contract within the next number of days, but as is. Okay, so uh, it says right here, to make any representations and insist on selling the property as is, this seems very one-sided to me. Shouldn't he be responsible for the condition of the premises or tenants? In our opinion, no Texas has long held buyers and sellers can agree to as is sale, and it, and it is enforceable. It puts the burden on the buyer to hire good inspectors, get copies of leases to review and confirm rents. This can all be done without the seller representing anything. It's as is. So, this can be done without the seller representing anything. You will want the seller to deliver good title and certify the leases and rent rolls are correct when they are assigned to you. Most sellers don't want the lingering liability after the closing, so this is how it's done. If the seller commits fraud, however, the as-is provision is no defense to that. Okay, next one is, uh, should a realtor be a party to home inspections? I, you know, uh, the uh, when I have inspections on properties, I really don't like to be there. I was, I've been there in the past, and uh, and sometimes I'll, uh, you know, I used to recommend inspectors because I thought they were good inspectors. They drove nice trucks and everything. But I tell you what, next time you have a, a representative buyer, say, this list of, of inspectors I don't recommend. And they're going to say, well, what's wrong? Because I don't want you to have the liability. I don't want you to recommend any specific or particular inspector because if the inspector makes a mistake, the buyer may come back to you. So I say, I don't recommend anyone, here's a list. And so you can, but you can handle it any way you want to. You can take the responsibility of inspecting it yourself. I'm kidding a little bit. But I mean, uh, if you're going to be there for the inspection, uh, best just to say nothing. Just sit there. Okay, after two hours or three hours, you can leave. Sometimes they last four hours long. And now, it'd be good if you're, if when you're doing these inspections to have structured mechanical, if there's a pool, have that done. Also check for termites, and also uh, check for AC because the because the independent inspector, the structure mechanical, is not authorized to take any plates off the AC units. And so you need really an HVAC system, which HVAC is is heating, ventilation, and air condition, to to check the units properly. You know, so those are the inspectors that you should have during inspections. Uh, one time I was. Uh, I sold a new construction in, in uh, Siena, and I told the buyer, I says, you ought to have an inspector for structural mechanical and also have a check for termites. 
He says, well, the city just approved of it, and they went to, through the permit department. I said, just have it checked anyway. So they found a few little odds and ends that the, the, the builder decided to make some changes. And he says, hey, I, I great, uh, great. I'm just glad you told me about that. And, and also they found termites. And I go, well, I sure am glad you told me about having it inspected for termites. What they had done, they had just kept building in more molds and more molds, and they passed the weed poles, and then there, so therefore they had termites in the property, but the builder took care of that too. So, I mean, you can, you know, a lot of buyers don't want to have the house inspected. You know, you might tell them to waive it and uh, 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 make sure that uh, you keep that monkey off your back and uh, so that you're not responsible for uh, in the inspections. Anyway, if you want to be there, that's up to you, but... Uh, I would, you can, they're going to send you a copy of the inspection report. Okay. We, we uh, let's see here. Uh, okay. I don't know if I covered this or not. Uh, oh, okay. This right here says, regarding, regarding your response to July the 15th, suggestion, any agent avoid tending any inspections while, yes, you want to limit liability of being a party to any of the potential liability. An agent also has a liability and responsibility to the seller who still owns the home. Letting inspector and buyers have a free reign of a home without a, any licensed realtor or licensed assistant there, not a good idea. In my opinion, this is a, a realtor making the, the question. Licensed inspector doesn't count. A lot can happen while he's on the roof or in the garage. In this day and age, the realtor should should be there as a disinterested party to the, to the inspection. Now, this is the answer from the attorney. He says, whether or not you want to attend a business is a business in judgment. We've heard both sides of the argument. We don't like to see a real estate agent as a defendant when they seem to have supervised an inspection that turns out to be bad. If you choose to take that risk, more power to you. Okay, and the next one is, I have a contract to sell my house. As we get closer and closer to the buyer's lender, the, the buyer's lender keeps throwing up roadblocks. Does that ever happen to you? <laughs> of course, it has all the way. So always keep that amendment to contract for an extension of closing because you'll run it. Anyway, there have been many delays. It seems to be uh, in control of everything. The buyer seems to be helpless. I don't want to extend the closing date. He has passed the contingency period for financing. You know what that is, a third-party financing. Can I keep the earnest money? Welcome to the new era of real estate finance. Lenders have more regulations than you can imagine, and more are on the horizon of, to be effective this October the 3rd, which is coming up soon. Trying to comply with these new regulations have many lenders in a tailspin, and many have stopped making home loans altogether. This is most likely not the buyer's fall. If you try to play hard line, you may get into a hole you can't get out of it. He may try to sue for specific performance of the contract and file a less pendants. If you don't know what a less pendants is, I'll tell you in just a second. And cloud your title. So once you file a less pendants, then they're not selling it to anybody. Uh, so the Texas Real Estate Commission is considering a change in the contract forms to provide the lender delays as they have become so common. Unless you have some major damage, we suggest waiting a few days to get through this. But make sure you have an amendment to contract to extend the closing. Uh, a less pendants is a is a less pendants is Latin for suit pending. A written notice that a lawsuit has been filed which concerns the title to real property and some interest in that real property. The less pendants or notice pending action is filed with the clerk of the of, uh, clerk of the court certify that it has been filed and then recorded with the county recorder. This gives notice to the defendant who owns and who owns real estate that there is a claim on the property and the recording informs the general public. In other words, uh, uh, try to work and try to make the deal if you can. Now, if, you, if it's impossible and you've extended it three or four times, of course somebody said in, the, in, the, in one of our sessions that the, well, they waited a year to close, so I mean, you know, that was a very patient seller. But that doesn't happen very often. I won't say any names, but there's Lila. I can't remember what her last name is. Anyway, oh. uh, what will the lender need to know about your finances? In other words, I want you to keep this in case you're working with, say, a first-time home buyer, or second-time, or third-time home buyer. I think you ought to have this information because what do we what do we need for the lender? Because uh, and then you might give this uh, this article to them. 
so that they will can be prepared on what to give to uh, the loan officer. Uh, so when applying for a mortgage, what financial documents are required? Whether you're buying or, or refinancing, lenders aren't going to simply take your word on how much you have in the bank and how much you earn. They're typically required two months of bank statements to make sure you haven't borrowed money to make it appear that you can, can afford a home that's really out of your reach. You typically need to provide at least two previous pay stubs. If there are any doubts, they may even call your employer to make sure you uh, confirm your salary. If you're self-employed, be prepared to provide a lot of documents about your business and income. They'll likely want complete Schedule C's for the past two years and may ask for any ask for receipts and invoices of the current year. If you have a fluctuating income, they may take an average over the course of several years to establish what they consider your average monthly income. And can I borrow money from a relative to help purchase my home? Yes, some buyers borrow money and take uh, gifts from relatives to make a down payment or closing costs, but you should. Uh, you should be up front about because lenders need to know where your cash is coming from. Is your assistant allowed to do that? Uh, uh, before I get started on this, uh, I would be careful about uh, having your assistant show property sometimes, and uh, I definitely wouldn't let them use your super key. So uh, you have to be careful when they are showing some property. If the if the owner's there and they're going to open up the door. That's fine, but if let's just say the owner's not there, and uh, they're going to have to know the, the codes to get in. They're going to they have to use. Uh, just be careful. But anyway, I'm going to. I understand there's a fine now if we lend our key and yes. give our number yes. to anybody. Yes. Yes. Not yes. only be careful, is don't do it. Right. Right. Is your assistant allowed to? But but then this article right here, it's kind of a gray area. So I mean, use your own judgment. Yes. Uh, can, can my unlicensed assistant set appointments to show a listing? Well, he probably can call and make an appointment. Yeah. Yes, an assistant may, uh, can call a homeowner and schedule an appointment for the broker to bring a potential buyer to see the home. If I'm the broker and I'm running late, can my unlicensed assistant drive the buyer to the listing and let them in the home? That's kind of a gray area. It says yes. But the assistant must be careful not to show the property to the buyer. The assistant should identify himself as an unlicensed assistant, explain his limited role. Any questions that arise regarding the property or, or the purchase of the property must be referred to to the broker. So, but I, you know, if you're going to take him over there and the owner's not there, you know, you, you, I don't think you ought to open up the lockbox or use a super key to open up the box to, to, to let him in. I just think you're just really getting into a gray area and it could be fined or it could suspend your license so just be careful uh, okay um, some agent was talking to me about emails and I said be careful what you write in emails because they can be contracts my sponsoring broker has a new rule that we cannot use emails anymore in corresponding with our clients or other par parties in today's in today's day and time, I think she she's nuts. Why would she do such a thing? Well, there may be some bad news out there. We recently had a case deciding at the Court of Appeals that held that three emails, two from the real estate agent and one from the seller, created an enforceable earnest money contract. That's enough to strike fear into the heart of any real estate agent. We all use emails and daily in our businesses, but when one starts making agreements in their correspondence, it can create new contracts and amend old contracts. If it's between the buyer and the seller, the agents don't know of the new deal, nor the attorneys, nor the title company. It can greatly complicate or delay a closing. Emails should be used very carefully if you use them at all. In other words, what I would do, let's just say they make an offer on the one to four family contract for say hundred thousand, and your you, your price is one hundred and ten, and then you. Uh, send them an email back, oh, uh, the sellers will take 105, meet you halfway, you know, and da 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 da. And then uh, the sellers go, oh, uh, maybe they changed their mind. And you might be stuck with 105, you may lose your commission or something. So, I mean, I would call the other agent over the phone and tell them they're willing to take X. I know one of the agents, especially I deal with here in the Sugarland area, and he refused to send any information on email. I said, leave a message on my voicemail. Just send me a, a text. Send me an email. No, I will tell you verbally over the phone what the owner will take. 
So, I mean, you can handle your business any way you want. I'm just trying to help you out a little bit. Okay. This is in, re, in re, uh, I'll, I'll go a little bit, I'll try to go as fast as I can. This is in regards to a, uh, a lease. What a tenant can do in domestic violence situations. A, a, a tenant in one of my properties says he was assaulted by another occupant and wants to vacate the property. Can he do that? Yes. But only if the tenant complies with the requirements of Section 92.016 of the Texas Property Code. And I'm going to let you read the rest on, the, on your own, but it states in the lease on page 13 of 16, it says, family violence tenant may terminate this lease if the tenant provides landlord with a copy of the court order described in 92.016 property code protecting the tenant or occupant from family violence committed by a co-tenant or occupant of the property. 92.106 property code governs the rights and obligations of the parties under this paragraph. If the family violence is committed by someone other than the co-tenant or co-occupant of the property, the tenant must give written notice of termination 30 days prior to effective date of the notice. The reason why I bring this up is because, you know, there's 16 pages to a lease. You know, years ago, back in the 60s, there was a one-page contract. I don't know how many pages there were to a lease, but there's 16 pages to a lease, and I really doubt that all the agents and all the buyers, I mean the owners and the tenants, read 16 pages of the lease. They probably say, where do I sign an initial? And how much money is it going to cost me? So I just wanted to bring a few things to your attention. Okay, the new changes. Uh, this is what was in the Texas Realty magazine right here, and I'm going to go over it real quick like on the changes. Uh, you probably got this magazine, but you probably just put it on your desk and said you're going to read it later. So I'm here to read it today. Uh, anyway. It says the legislation passed during the 84 Texas legislature requires changes to Texas Real Estate Commission forms. The, those changes are well as others recommended by broker lawyer committee will be considered at the uh, TREC meeting on August the 17th. I believe that was the day before yesterday. Yeah. Any form modifications adopted on August 17th will be adopted on an emergency basis, mandatory uh, use for September the 1st and reviewed again at TREC's November meeting. At the November meeting, the changes uh, adopted on August 17th will be reviewed and considered for permanent adoption. They could also be tweaked before permanent adoption. Changes affecting the Texas Real Estate Commission contracts. Modifications listed on the next page will appear when the appropriate, but may not appear in all TREC contracts. Now, uh, what I'd like for you all to do is, is, is these contracts are in line next so uh, just go to those contracts, and then you can follow me. I have a question. Does uh, zip form update as soon as it Most of the time they up? will. Most of the time they will. Zip forms most of the time will, will, will update. But, you know, uh, just uh, that's a good is, question. In zip forms, when you, if you have your templates, if you have some saved in the template. Oh, yeah, forget those. And when you try to move them down to start one, if there's been a change, it will notify you. Yeah, but I tell you what, I, I would start using new, a new templates as soon as those changes are made to zip form because you've got that old template here back four or five years ago, and then you move it up to, to fill in the blanks. Well, you know, you'd be using an old old contract. So I mean, be careful of what you save. So, and look at the dates and everything. So, uh, and I've I've done that. Yeah. I, no, I, I was I, making the mistake of like say I have a buyer and we put in a contract that they didn't buy the house. I use the same contract, erase all that information, you know, just to keep their information in mind. It ended up being an old, old contract, right? Yes. So I mean, be careful of your templates. I mean, be careful of what you've saved in the past. You might just open up a new one when Zip Farms makes the changes and save those and delete the old ones. Okay. And for the new people, be careful of the forms that you take. Excuse me, from back there is in the copies. Yeah. Right. Oh. Don't yeah. use those. Right. The zip forms are probably more up to date than the ones back there. But I tried. What I try to do is uh, notify the the girls up front yeah. that make the copies and uh, Nat and whoever's making copies to uh, keep a, abreast of the new changes rather than making the old ones that's already in the slots. And in other words, I'll I'll give them. Now, if y'all have y'all see changes that come up, make sure that uh, you, you you tell the girls up front. And so because they're the ones that's making copies of the contracts that's in the back. So. You know, take it. How are they going to keep abreast of whatever changes? Would, what, but when you see when you see the, yeah, when you see the changes, them, give them to the girls exactly. so that they won't be making copies of the old stuff because they usually have it underneath their cardboard. The mm -hmm. old ones are out here that's in yellow. Don't don't use the last one. And so uh, you uh, just just uh, notify them of the changes. Anyway, go to paragraph three. Go to paragraph four, and we're going to go to paragraph six in just a moment.
So paragraph three, the rel the relationship. You can use hers if you want to. Yeah. Okay, you got it. Well, I tell you, photographic memory. What can I say? Now, the relationship between credit approval and property approval has always been a source of confusion to license holders. To clear up their confusion, Trek is proposing a new party financing addendum, which will be contain the financing information. So that's that's the three and four. But the main thing. In my opinion, I was going to go over that uh, right there in number three, or number four, it says 4A1, property approval. If the property does not satisfy the lender's underwriting requirements for the loan, including but not limited to appraisal, insurability, and lender required repairs, buyer may terminate this contract by giving notice to the seller prior to closing and the earnest money will be refunded to the buyer. So if that wording is still in the new ones, you know, they're going to they're going to go back to this right here and get their earnest money back. So I want to know what the new wording is for the new contracts, if it's going to change or we have the same wording in here. So that's the part right there, the underwriting requirements. In other words, let's just say you're past the third party financing uh, addendum, the X, X number of days, which are going to change, but so, say today. They got 21 days, and on the 25th day, they hire, they, they get the appraisal done, and the appraisal is short. Well, according to this, you can get out of the contract. Some sellers have asked me, say, hey, Wayne, how about the appraisal? How about the, appraisal? How about the house doesn't appraise for X dollars? And I go, you're back to negotiations. She says, I was afraid of that. So, I mean, the buyer can get out. How about insurability? How about if there's a, I don't know, fire or, so, you know, it's in the... Floodway or floodplain or, you know, roof too old. so what? Roof too old. Well, whatever. Well, that that's a lender required repair. And by the way, who's responsible for lender required repairs? Neither. Neither party. So uh, we've only gone over that a hundred times. Mm. And then lender required repairs. So the next one is lender required repairs. So if uh, I've had the buyers do the lender required repairs, most of the time it's the seller. But uh, I've had the buyers do the lender required repairs, so everything is negotiable. Anyone to bring that to your attention? Uh, if if that that, fa that 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 wording right there does not satisfy lender's underwriting requirements for the loan, including but not limited to. Okay, the next is paragraph six. Paragraph six. Uh, it says, uh, add, uh, add or to paragraph 6A8 with title policy addresses, address confusion about which boxes to check. Also, add new sub paragraph 6E10, which right there, 6E10 is, uh, of course, that will be the new, new, on the new contract. Because um, you notice it stops at 9. Um, also, add new sub paragraph 6E10 that contains new disclosure about fluctuating water levels that's required for properties near certain bodies of water. Uh, paragraph 7, add the following sentence to 7A to clarify what inspection means and what it doesn't mean. Any hydrostatic testing must be separately authorized by seller in writing. Oh, by the way, I saw an email where uh, one of the companies were giving some $100 off or something for this. Uh -huh. yeah. For this. Uh, hydrostatic uh, testing. So I think they came into the office and uh, so you might want to keep that email in case they, you have to have that uh, done. Uh, paragraph 9, add new language to paragraph 9A that addresses the party's options for handling closing delays caused by disclosure timelines implemented under the TELA-RESPA integrated disclosure rules. Paragraph 13, amend the rollback taxes to improve its readability and ensure that its intent is reflected in the language. Paragraph 14, let's see, let me, let me jump in here. Paragraph 14, add to the phrase that makes it clear that the buyer only has the option to accept the property in damaged condition with the assignment of insurance proceeds if approved by seller's insurance company. Ah, back to paragraph 18, what I said before on paragraph 18. If a court determined that the three times the amount of earnest money language in paragraph 18D was unenforceable penalty, so therefore the phrase has been changed. So that uh, I mentioned to you earlier in the class about 18, about three times. So apparently uh, the three times the amount of earnest money language in paragraph 18D was unenforceable penalty. The phrase has been changed. 
Paragraph 23, the termination option now ends at 5 p.m. A lot of people go, well, when's the option period in? 12 midnight? 8 o'clock at night? So they're going to make that wow. 5 p.m. So That's after 5. Huge. Yes. So, I mean, you better you better watch, you know, the uh, mm -hmm. uh, it ends at 5 o'clock uh, mm -hmm. instead of 12 midnight. But that's good. 12, yes. t t paragraph 23, the termination. Depends on which side you're on. Yeah. <laughs> that's true. That's true. So, uh, and a lot of times people count the day of that you sign the contract, but it's really the, the, the next, next day. That's 24 mm -hmm. hours is the first day. So, I mean, but... Um, I would try to get everything done, and I don't really don't like seven-day options. I like 10-day or 15-day options to give the guy time. Let's just say they have a certain inspector they want to use, or uh, it just delays, and so... Uh, Inspectors are always busy. Right, and they're tied up, the appraisers are... But anyway, uh, most of the time you don't have an appraiser during the option period, because you... But the structure, you got to have structural mechanical, you have to have termites, HVAC, pool inspectors, you might even have a roof inspector. You know, you may have to have four or five different inspectors. Uh, so anyway, uh, it, so I said it ends at five o'clock. Broker information out of place for a sales associate license in the broker information section. In other words, down here on the uh, last page of the contract, under broker information, you'll have to add another some more information on that. Uh, it's for sales associate license number in the, in the broker information section. And changes affecting the uh, farm and ranch, well, I'll, I'll let you work that on your own. And changes affecting on the residential condominium, well, if you sell condos, uh, you can look at this. And other proposed form changes, TREC proposes a new financing addendum, third-party financing addendum to replace the existing third-party financing addendum for credit approval. The proposed addendum also includes the reverse mortgage, so the reverse mortgage addendum will be repealed. TREC proposes changes to the seller's disclosure of property condition, which will be adopted voluntarily use until January the 1st, 2016, at which point it will be mandatory. And TREC proposes changes to the condominium resale certificate. So, that uh, takes care of the changes that will just try to keep you abreast of what's going on. And somebody, and one of the agents always asked me to cover up. Uh, the code of ethics. Uh, this, I'll go over it real quick. Like the next nav navigation tools, uh, I, I cover the code of ethics for about five minutes. So I'm going to try to cover all of code of ethics. So, okay. are you allowed to give code of ethics class? No. no. The next navigation uh, tool is the concept of articles of the code. The 17 articles of the code are divided into three categories previously mentioned. Articles. Okay are broad statements of ethical principles which we as realtors subscribe to, the structure of the code. When we look at Article 1 in detail later, we'll readily see the principle of protecting and promoting the interest of clients. You can also see the duty of, to treat all parties to the transaction honestly. There are types of broad ethical principles established in each article. They illustrate this idea considering a standard practice of 1, 2, 3, which states realtors and attempted to secure a listing shall not deliberately mislead the owner as to market value. Clearly, if you mislead an, uh, an owner about market value, you are not protecting and promoting the owner's interest. Uh, structure of the code, interpreting and explaining the articles and the standards of practice. Look under Article 1, and you'll see there are 15 related standards of practice. Standards of practice support, interpret, and amplify the articles. Realtors cannot be found in violation of a standard of practice. And the, uh, let's see. Uh, Beware of the only the articles that can be violated. Standards of practice and case interpretation can only be cited in support of alleged victim, alleged violation of the article. The structure of the code, the last reference tool of interpreting code is a set of specific examples known as the interpretations of the code of ethics. There are in fact uh, specific situations to which the articles and standards of practice are applied. And pathways to professionalism. The code of ethics establishes the objective enforceable ethical and standards it does not address issues of courtesy or etiquette and then the last one pathways to professionalism pathways to professionalism covers three areas respect to the public respect for property and respect for peers and it says uh, even though pathways consist of suggestions rather than uh, real realtors should strive to follow the pathways to professionalism anyway I'll cover a little bit of code of ethics uh, on each, each day but anyway we 
covered quite a bit today. I appreciate your time and patience. Um, I guess that's it. Thank you very much.